There are two minutes to be off. Walthamstow Greyhound Stadium, the Stowe, an East London landmark, held its last race night in mid-August. I miss it a lot because uh, it's not somewhere I go every week, but it's somewhere I have been going you know, reasonably regularly for quite a number of years. It is the best and it has the most wonderful... <laughs> I go dog racing all over the country and I, this is one of the most enjoyable tracks I've ever been to. And as I say, I started coming here when I was about 11, 11 or 12 and I took to it even at that tender age. And Walthamstow to me is, has been part of my life. The atmosphere at Walthamstow is unique. There's nowhere like it in the world. The crowd noise, the reaction of people, are having a great night out, the social scene of it. Even non-greyhound people have a wonderful night. They get behind the racing. It's a wonderful atmosphere. There's just sim simply nothing like it. It's simply the best. You can't imagine r greyhound racing in London without Walthamstow Stadium. And it is so sad. You know, why something couldn't have been done to have kept it going, I don't know. Oh, I think there'd be some tears and I think everybody would be upset. We're all going out for a drink after. We used to raise a lot of money for the Hackney Hospice. We used to have charity nights here on a regular basis. We often would raise £15,000. Walthamstow was attracted the biggest crowds out of any of the stadiums in the UK. Because this is the best one in the world. This is the best track in the world. There's no other track like it. It is the number one in this country and it's seen if your top same goes in any business, if your top tier goes then you're in an awful lot of trouble and there will only be one greyhound track left in London. If you're paying to get in, far left hand doors, far left if you're paying. Middle doors, six pack, starway, track pack, tickets, middle doors. Any other passes, far right. But if you're paying cash, over on the left if you're paying cash. The Stowe was almost certainly the most successful and best greyhound stadium in the world. It was the flagship for dog racing in this country. It was to Walthamstow what the Eiffel Tower is to Paris. Mass entertainment used to mean cinemas, dance halls and greyhound racing. Not anymore. What made Walthamstow dogs such a fantastic night out and the reason why celebrities flocked to have their photos taken there is that it had a great atmosphere. When the races were run, the atmosphere was electric. You don't get that kind of electricity with a video game. The Stowe should have been celebrating its 75th anniversary this year. A fine reason for a knees up and a bit of publicity. In the old days, the Chandler family, who had run the stadium since it opened in 1933, would not have missed the opportunity. But greyhound racing is not what it once was. In the mid-1940s, the dogs clocked up something like 50 million attendances and there were 77 licensed tracks. Last year, only 3 million attended the 30 tracks that remain. The first nail in the coffin was legalised betting in the 1960s. Up to that point, the only way to make a legal bet was to go to a track. At first, when it was made legal, opening hours were highly restricted. Then came late night opening hours of bookmakers, direct competition with the stadium. Finally, and perhaps worst of all, there was the abolition of the general betting duty in 2001. General betting duty taxed off-course gambling. It never applied to the on-course bookmakers. The tax was abolished because British bookies said they were being driven out of business by the internet. Gamblers could place a bet on their home computer without having to pay the tax. The government acted swiftly to save the bookies but damage the dog tracks. Since there was no tax benefit to actually go into the stadiums, many of the heavy punters stopped coming. Attendances dropped. Greyhound racing was at its peak of popularity during the wartime era, and in terms of the marketing of the sport and the PR around the sport, it really hasn't evolved very much since then. And I think the perception that it's old men coming down with a pint of bitter and 
it's just not like that. The reality is that you see generations of families, you see young people out on nights out. You know, Walthamstow even had the nightclub attached to it, Charlie Chans, which helped even more so attract a younger audience. And you'd see dozens and dozens of people going to the Greyhounds as a bit of a warm-up to going into the club on a, on a night out. I think the people that have run it haven't kept up with modern times. They lived off the good old days and didn't move with development. It never moved with the 21st century. Could they have thought of anything else to put in its place on these three nights when it's not racing? Could they put in uh, pop concerts or anything like that? I don't know. I don't know. Motorbike racing, stock car racing, there was a Sunday market. There are there there are several things that they used to do which they stopped doing because they always thought, oh, it's Walthamstow, everyone will always come to Walthamstow. But you can't, but you can't afford to be complacent in a modern world. There was no marketing, there was no TV advertising, there was no globe press coverage. They were never really made facilities. If someone came and uh, did a rescue, you know, an evening out for a corporate entertainment, shall we say, they never bothered to go down there and make a big fuss of them, to incorporate them back. So when you're doing that, you know, you've just got no chance of getting that return business. That's what's wrong there. If greyhound racing is ever to halt the decline and grow in popularity, it needs to introduce itself to a whole new generation who either aren't aware of it at all or have a complete misconception about the reality of the sport. And there's very few sports where you can get so close to the track and soak up the atmosphere. It's very accessible from a cost point of view. You know, how many places can you go out and for a tenner have something to eat, something to drink, place a few bets? I mean, it's cheaper than going to the cinema. And what we could see as punters ourselves is that it's hypnotic. Once you've got through the door and you've seen it as a night out, any preconceptions that you may have had are completely shattered and you're a real fan and an advocate. And what we did with our agency, which is 50, 60 people, all of a sudden these 50, 60 people started inviting their friends and our clients and telling everyone about it. I took my mum and dad there for a night out. I mean, they would have never gone to the Greyhound Racing had I not invited them. And once they went there, they loved it. And they went back again and again and again. In May 2008, the Charners announced that the stadium had been sold to property developers. The announcement caused outrage amongst Greyhound enthusiasts. One called Rick Holloway put together a rival bid for the site. Well, it isn't a great time to build houses, and I think uh, hopefully this will make them rethink again. We need housing in the area, but you know I don't want to see housing at the expense of everything else. No, no, there's too many houses in Walthamstow anyway. There's load, load of buildings gone on. Every time there's a space, it's built on it. Now, this would be nice to, to keep as a racing racing venue, basically. What we're saying is, you could come under pressure, and for a whole combination of pressures, you've just given up on this. And actually, there are lots of things it could do to change that place around. It's a community facility. Why do we get rid of another community facility just for more houses? We can do other houses. We've got plenty of places here where we can put up houses. Do we really need another housing estate? No. And to sell it to, to people who are going to have it as a, some sort of building, um, some sort of massive estate, when people can't sell houses anyway at the moment, I just don't see it at all. Attendances in the last three or four weeks have actually shot up because you've got people who are saying, oh, I'm going to go before it closes, even people who've never been there before. It's a treble their door taking is easy. This place, this is just like a casino. It's made to print money. It is a money-making thing. Anyone that knows anything about dog racing, especially if you've got a place like this, if you can't make money, then there's something badly you're doing wrong. The ones that are coming now are the ones that are jumping on the bandwagon because the place is closing. It's sad for genuine punters and as I say, I live in Ryslip, I come all the way here. Getting planning permission should be quite difficult since much of the site has been listed Grade 2 by English Heritage. The local council has scheduled the land as suitable for public assembly and leisure. In theory, the developers should have quite a problem getting permission Another London stadium, Catford, is undeveloped five years after the last dog race was run. There's nothing you can do to stop a private owner selling their assets, and that's, that's, that's the, 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 the root problem, if you like. The council maybe could uh, do something using planning law, but they can't, you can't stop the actual sale. 
I think it was right to list it. Uh, and, and of course, when that was done, and that was about three years ago, I think people hoped that this would be something that would stop the, the, the stadium being redeveloped for, uh, for housing or industrial use. It's housing it's likely to be, I guess. Um, but of course, it hasn't worked. At the end of the day, the listing isn't going to stop the stadium being sold and being redeveloped. I mean, it may mean that bits of it get preserved, but that's as far as it's going to go. And you know, when you've got a place like this that's been there 75 years, and you know, you talk to people from outside Walthamstow, you know, you talk to someone you've not met, not met before, or where do you come from, and you say Walthamstow, and the number of people who recognise Walthamstow because of the Greyhound Stadium is actually a huge number. Lots and lots of people have been there. I mean, just in the last few weeks since it was announced that it was going to close, I mean, I've had letters from all over the country. It's all part of our heritage, and we're losing our traditions very easily. Uh, it's one of those things that we want to try and keep going rather than closing them down. Almost everybody who talks about the Stowe uses the word iconic sooner or later. <laughs> there is widespread agreement that English heritage was right to list elements of the stadium to make it extremely difficult to bulldoze them. It's going to look very strange. It's going to look extremely strange. But if you know if developers are willing to build that and people are willing to buy it, then it'll happen. And, and how is kennels will be used in years ahead? I'm not too sure. But certainly the design is very iconic. It is um, uh, it's quite unique. Actually, I haven't seen anything like it. And uh, I'm pleased that parts of the track will be preserved. Whatever whatever may happen in the future. A Save the Stoke campaign held marches and organised a petition. Campaigners included local MP Neil Gerrard and former Conservative Party leader Ian Duncan Smith, both Greyhound owners in their time. Mr Duncan Smith has a retired Greyhound. Neil Gerrard owned a dog that ran at the track. At almost the same time as the Grade 2 listing was being announced, the local council was talking to developers about building houses there. A draft planning brief was even produced, giving a tacit nod to house building. And all we do at the moment in this area is get rid of one facility after another. The council is in a good position to talk to the housing developers, London and Quadrant. It knows them very well. L&Q took over a large number of council houses in the area. Clyde Lokes, leader of the Waltham Forest Council, was not prepared to appear on this documentary to put the council's point of view. A pity, since he could also have answered charges made by the Chandlers that the Stowe had been forced to have far more staff than any other stadium as a result of unusual interpretations of health and safety regulations locally. No doubt the council acted in good faith. Planning officers were told that the stadium could not survive because it was unprofitable. It was impossible for them to check since talks were secret. Besides, everyone knew the Chalmers were experts when it came to running Greyhound stadiums. How could they be wrong? <laughs> Tracks that have disappeared in the London area include Catford, Haringey, Hackney, Hendon, Stratford, West Ham and White City. You can still visit Hendon and may even see the old dog there. They built the Brent Cross shopping centre on the site. What worries me is that what will happen is that it will sit there empty for quite some while because, you know, even just the last few weeks, you know, the housing market looks to be in decline. And you just wonder whether a developer is going to be really keen to build houses just at this moment or even in the next next year or so. Now, there's another Greyhound track shut down in London five years ago, Catford. And Catford was shut down and houses were going to be built on the, the site. Not a brick has been laid five years later. There hasn't been a lot of activity there, save that the track itself, unfortunately, has been pretty much demolished, but um, not a lot of building activity there. And as I say, we wouldn't want Walthamstow to lie derelict 
and, and run down for a couple of years. I said to the, the Housing Association people, who, in London and Quadrant, who are involved with Waltham stock, I hope I'm not going to see this like Catford, you know, that in four or five years' time it's just lying here. Oh, no, 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 no. They said, no, no, we'll, we'll, we'll definitely be, uh, be building, we'll definitely be building. But I'm just worried, you know, with the housing market on the pressure that it'll sit there idle. At the front of the building is listed, the back of the building is listed, the site. So I just don't see how you can put houses around without touching the front and the back. Dougie Tyler, an 89 year old, is one of a handful of bookies left at the track. I came here with the, fir the first day I opened with my grandfather. <laughs> you never had casinos before, you never had betting shops before. It's all added to the taking it away from what we used to know as the on course betting market. That's all been taken away from us. If you bet on the internet or some of these betting exchanges like Betfair, you can do things like bet against a dog or a horse. You can back, back something to lose. And I think that has made quite a big difference because you used to see people there who would bet quite big money. And there used to be a lot of bookmakers there and there's only a handful now. Betting turnover on greyhound racing is at an all-time high and, and greyhound racing is a hugely popular product with punters across the country in betting shops, on the internet or at tracks themselves. About two and a half billion pounds is, is wagered off course alone on, on greyhound racing each year, so it's, it's still hugely popular. The people that come on a Saturday night to the dogs are not gamblers, they come out for a social night out. You can come with a fiver, I mean, so you can have 10p on the tote, you can have a drink, you know, for a pensioner who hasn't got a lot of money. And let's say, face it, in this day and age where the cost of living is, is astronomical and, and everything's going up, you know, for, for a pound to get in a night, where can you go for a night's entertainment? Free some nights, not even a pound. A pound tonight for the entertainment you're going to get tonight, the good racing that's on here tonight, where can you get it? There used to be about 40, 50 bookmakers here. I don't know how many actually, but I would say at least 50. We've got seven. And uh, it, it's uh, not an easy business now. I've had a thousand on many times. I can show you, just to, no, 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 no you don't want to see. But I can, I can show you, um, you know, some of my statements. And, um, but oh, you know, I'm, I like a punt, you know, I do like a bet. The last time I come, I won 60 pound. <laughs> Some tracks you can go and you can stand there and a racer come on and you put your prices up and you don't strike a bet. Don't strike a bet. Nobody, nobody wants to have a bet. Otherwise you might take 30 or 40 pounds on a race. I don't have a thousand pounds. Well, I have a thousand pounds on sometimes. And, uh, but I won't have it on the track because then I've got to walk. I don't drive. I've got to get trains and that to get home. I'm not going to walk around with £2,000 or odd in my pocket. I back it over the phone and come here to watch it run. That's what that. I've got enough money to gamble. <laughs> No one was consulted about the closure, and the, uh, I wasn't, and I know that the, uh, the British Greyhound Racing Board knew nothing about it until it was announced. It was in fact put on the website of Walthamstow Greyhound Stadium in January of this year that they were never going to sell, and they assured, called all the trainers in, assured them of all the assurances, nothing was going to happen, you know, that track was staying open, that was it, 
then less than six months later, it sold. And the most annoying thing was it sold without the um, knowledge of the industry. I sold to social housing without even giving the opportunity for the Greyhound fraternity to actually step in and buy it. And that, I feel, is the complete betrayal of Greyhound racing. <laughs> Nobody knows which architect was responsible for the universally acclaimed as iconic front and tote board with its giant neon greyhound. Years ago, the dog used to have multiple legs, lit one after the other to give the impression that it was running. Today, the dog, like much of the rest of the stadium, looks a bit tatty. The stadium was still run by the Chandlers, Bill's grandchildren, but insiders say they seem to have lost enthusiasm for the stow and the older ones want to retire. There's a lot of work to be done, quite honestly. I mean, a lot of leakage and stuff like that around, like, you know, it's a shame, but I mean, maintenance people do come in. It's going to need a few repairs and it's got to go in, uh, as I say, for the disabled. We need the disabled lift and different stuff in there. They'll have to spend quite a bit of money, I should imagine, whoever. If anyone did keep this open, I should imagine you'd have to spend at least near enough a million pounds to get it up and running. Greyhounds live for about 12 to 14 years, but they rarely race much once they get past their sixth birthday. Each year there is a huge number retiring and many greyhounds bred for racing never make the grade. Not everyone is upset about the closure. Animal activists have been campaigning to shut the stow down. Well, absolutely. I mean, we're pleased when any um, greyhound track closes down. Equally passionate about animal rights is Johanna Boma. Daily, Daily, come on. Here, that's the boy. A former head teacher who has been finding homes for retired greyhounds for 43 years. But she is a champion of dog racing and used to spend every Saturday night at Walthamstow. Whereas before the majority were put down, now the majority are found homes. The track like Walthamstow, the big tracks, look after the dogs. We have uh, very strict welfare and integrity standards. And they were saying that I was cruel to dogs, I'd kill, there was a killing room in there and things like that. And I've never ever put a dog dog in, in my life. Some of the trainers do muzzle their dogs, uh, not necessarily because they're vicious, but also because they're afraid of them hurting themselves. I mean, some of these dogs are worth 15, 25,000 pounds, so the trainers are very often extra careful. But coming into a kennel like this, you can see the real temperament of the dog. As I say, there's 48 here. Uh, they come in here, they don't know any of the other dogs. They just get on with them immediately. We, we very seldom use a muzzle except when we're walking them out on the field. No, they're, they're, they're the most pampered species of dogs you can think of. All this nonsense about how they're ill-treated they are, that's a great lot of nonsense. If you look at a great racing ground, their tails are wagging, their eyes are alert, their whole body is, you know, really wanting to go. And when you look at a greyhound, a good greyhound in full flight, I don't think you can find a better sight. The industry as a whole, very sadly, uh, doesn't love dogs. We care for them, I tell you, we really, really care for them. You couldn't take my dogs, you couldn't do anything to my dogs, I tell you. They are, and they are so well looked after, they're like a hotel where they're where they kept. Because of the demand that that track creates for dogs to be bred, a track like Walthamstow is responsible for the killing of over 500 greyhounds every year. Well, I'm not quite sure where they get their figures from, to be honest, um, because it's very difficult to account for exactly how many dogs are finishing every year. And basically, I can only really speak for Walthamstow. And I, the Walthamstow dogs have, for years now, come into the system and been rehomed. They're either kept by the trainers, if they're really, really good, obviously they go stud dogs, brood bitches. Um, alternatively, some of the owners take them, I mean some of the owners do actually take them home themselves, there are some very good owners. Uh, kennel staff take them home, track staff take them home. We advertise and find homes in the home finding schemes, so really and truly there is no need for the dogs from the larger tracks to be put down. The demand created by the greyhound racing industry causes 
something like 25,000 greyhounds a year to be bred. This is the industry in Britain as a whole. Now only 10,000 of those dogs actually make it to the tracks. The other 15,000 are disposed of before they even race. And very sadly, most of those dogs end up being put to death. Uh, it's not strictly true what, what um, these groups have suggested. Uh, greyhound breeding, to put it in perspective, is, is carried on a pretty small scale in this country. It's in the breeder's interest to get as many greyhounds that he or she breeds onto the track. Um, to do otherwise is really financial suicide. So the other thing I should say, it's very easy to rehome a, a, a pup, a pup greyhound. If, it, if it's obvious at 12 or 15 months it's not sufficiently fast or, or sufficiently interested in chasing the hare to race, there should be no problems at all in rehoming that greyhound, unless, of course, it is temperamentally unsuitable for rehoming. A lot of those dogs get put to death in Ireland because most dogs, 80% of greyhounds that race on the tracks in Britain, actually come from Ireland. A large number of greyhounds that race on these shores are bred in Ireland. Um, Ireland has its own greyhound racing industry, if you like. It has its own 20 tracks, uh, very successful tracks, and it has quite a large-scale training and breeding operation. This is definitely a major problem in Ireland. We have no jurisdiction over Ireland. We are working with government here um, and liaising with the Irish authorities, actually, to, to develop um, areas of, of mutual concern and, and benefit and, and work with them as best we can. The dogs are well looked after exceptionally well looked after, I mean most of the time better than some pet dogs at home. Misconception by the press and people just don't understand, same as animal activists, they just do not understand, you can't reason with them. I think the future for greyhound racing is not looking too promising. Well, I think we may end up with perhaps 20 to 25 tracks. If Walthamstow goes I think greyhound racing is absolutely finished in this country. It's not only very sad for Walthamstow and the people that work at Walthamstow and the punters, because they love it here as well. It's, it's a very sad thing for greyhound racing as a whole. Yeah, I think it's all going to be fizzled out unless some, some miracle can manage to get everything up and running again. It may only be a few years. Um, it, it's already massively smaller than, than at one time. Yarmouth Stadium uh, in Great Yarmouth in Norfolk. Uh, they've recently completed a very impressive uh, restaurant facility that cost upwards of £2 million, I understand, and that's really helped uh, build their business. Crowds are up, turnover is up, there's a really positive vibe at, at that track. Uh, Nottingham Stadium currently building a, a new restaurant to increase its capacity there. Kinsley Stadium in Yorkshire, in a small mining village, great track there. Uh, again, new corporate facilities, new restaurant facilities, really helping to safeguard the future of the track. And then further south at Peterborough, a similar story, and even at Wimbledon, a £100,000 investment recently. The track at Reading's due to close later in the year, so that'll be 28. Um, and in terms of London, uh, after Walthamstow closes, the only other track in the sort of what you might call the London postal area is Wimbledon. With Walthamstow closing, that really signals the end of the sport as a whole, which is an even bigger loss. Muriel Topham sold Aintree to developers some years ago and the horse race industry united and stopped the development just like we are going to do. There's a lot of jobs there. You look at Walthamstow Stadium and there are going to be 400 jobs going. Now, most of them will uh, part-time rather than full-time, but there's a lot of people who have part-time jobs there. You know, evenings, three evenings a week, working in the bars, in the restaurants, on the totes, and they're all going to lose their jobs and they won't find, they won't find replacement jobs easily. You know, these are, you know, there's quite a lot of economic consequences from, from a big track like Walthamstow going. That's on an average Saturday night, you're looking over 400, over 400 staff. One of the security officers, his grandmother works there, his mother works there, he's, he works there, his daughter works on the tote. I'm going back to school cleaning, if I can get the jobs, because I don't want to stay at home. I need the, you need the money, you can't live on a pension, 64 quid a week, it's impossible. Probably you'd end up going for security, I know there's a few jobs at Romford Stadium where they're asking for security at Romford and a few other places. 
Grayan racing has its own language and values. Almost everybody in the business knows everybody else. It is a tight-knit community. If you are not part of it, it probably doesn't mean much to you. But the fascination with dogs and hares goes back a very long way. Some ancient people said that there was not a man in the moon, but a hare. And if you look at the moon above the stadium, you can see what they mean. Dog racing seems as traditional as pints of beer, fish and chips, flat caps and jelly deals. But in fact it only dates back to about 1912 and was invented in America. Hair coursing and whippy racing has a much older history, but the circular track and the mechanical hair were created by Owen Patrick Smith, known as OP, an idealist who wanted to stop the killing of jack rabbits the dogs chased in America instead of hares. OP's invention reached Britain when the Bellevue Stadium in Manchester started racing in 1927. Walthamstow came onto the scene fairly late, thanks to a colourful bookmaker called William George Chandler. Bill Chandler was a non-drinker, reserved and tall. He had a poker face, wore a Savile Row suit and had a reputation for taking huge and sometimes bizarre bets. He discovered what was at the time called the Billet Ground, a so-called flapping track where whippet racing took place. Finding the track owner, he asked how much he wanted for the ground, agreed the price and paid in cash later that day. The man that started this was the grandfather of the people that are here now, that is old Bill Chandler. He was a director of Hackney Wick Stadium. Rumour has it that uh, the director of Hackney Wick Stadium fell out and he was so annoyed over it all that he vowed to build another stadium, which he did. He built this one, which opened in 1933. Now, he was the governor. He had seven sons, I believe it was seven sons and a daughter. Uh, he was uh, a big gambler, big card player, and obviously a very strong man. And he built this up. And then when he died, uh, his son Charles took it over and he was the managing director. I had the utmost respect for that man. He was bought at the stadium through and through. He could stand no nonsense. He could talk with lords and ladies or he could talk with the, the villains. Whichever way he wanted to talk, he could talk with them. But his, his baby was bought at the stadium and a very, very fair man would stand no nonsense from anybody and his word was law and uh, now it is different I've got eight directors and of course no, all directors don't agree with everything Although some of the Chandlers are retiring the Chandler name will continue to be associated with gambling and dog racing thanks to Victor Chandler Victor was one of the bookmakers who helped create the internet betting industry his business is said to turn over more than £1 billion in 160 different countries. In fact, he probably could have bought the stove and kept it going. Major bookies, Coral, Laybrooks and William Hill, each own two tracks and make a very good job of running them. Some hoped Victor Charler could have been the first internet bookie to join the club. I think it's fair to say that the Charners as a family, they are, most of them are reaching retirement age. They are winding down uh, their interests um, in the last year where Charles has stepped down from his positions on some of the boards. It's at the stage now where they're looking to retire. I'm not sure there's too many young people in their family who want to come through and take on the business. Philip Chandler left a year ago to go abroad. Charles Chandler resigns from the BGRB and it seems to me that there just seems to be, well, some kind of plan here, what's been going on. Um, I can't put my finger on it. I know one thing that is not true is the fact that the reason why they were stated said that they had lost money. That stadium has never lost money in 75 years, according to Company's House. It's their property, isn't it? They can do what they want, you know what I mean? Yeah, I don't know. They're a not nice family sort of thing, I'm saying that, but I still think it should not, not go, you know. Never mind, it's one of those things, isn't it? I don't think they want anyone to run it better than they did. That is my honest opinion. I wish I could see um, the Chandlers come forward and put this on camera or even speak to the press because you can't get to them at all to get an answer out of them. There was a capacity crowd for the last night. 
Several of the Charlers were there and they came in for some stick. Grand racing is an odd business because the stadium is really a market to which traders bring their stalls. The Charlers own the stadium but they do not own the independent bookmakers, the kennels, the dogs or even a peanut concession. They may have wanted to retire but most of the people who ran those small businesses or hobbies did not want to quit. Many of them are being forced into premature retirement. There were supposed to be 14 races, but one failed to happen. The hare refused to run. There was a mechanical failure, so there was 13 races. Unlucky for the greyhound business. At about 11.30, the crowd began to leave, but some thought that such a big occasion had to be marked in some way. A few decided to get on the track and walk round. That few turned into hundreds, and then the souvenir hunting began. The police were called, but a certain amount of damage was done. It was not an obvious contribution to the Save the Stow campaign. A sad way to end. Greyhound racing is one of a declining number of public entertainments where alcohol is freely available, yet there is never any trouble. If someone does start to get unduly boisterous, another member of the crowd will soon put them in their place. Rick Holloway and Richard Codd still dream of running the best dog stadium in the world, promising a super race with prize money never before dreamt of in the sport. Save our stuff! Save our stuff! Save our stuff! And I certainly was looking at putting people off. I was trying to put more people on. With the crowds I believe this place can generate, I'd be offering jobs. Certainly not cutting jobs. Yeah. Because so, social becomes before a profit. That's how my father taught me. Nothing wrong with profit, it makes a world around. But there is a social side to life that comes well before profit. I guarantee you one thing, I'll make money. I will make money in this track. Yeah. And I, I will keep people employed. I will make money. I'll show them. I will show them how you make money. Most of those who have been privileged to spend a pleasant evening in the summer sunshine at the Stow will be sorry the place has gone, even those who have lost a bob or two from time to time. Opie, the man who invented the mechanical hair, believed he was striking a blow against cruelty. He saw greyhound racing as a way to stamp out the cruel sport like hair coursing, but that was nearly 100 years ago. Maybe in the 21st century we have different values. If so, anglers and pigeon fans should had better watch out. After the excesses of the last night, there was still the cleaning to be done. My name is Brian Elford and I worked there for 31 years managing the car parking. They're going to demolish it but I want to see it all clean before they do it because everything's going to be sold. Chippers, ovens, they're all going to be sold. Everything's going to be sold. But all the um, tickets have got to be cleared up out here and that. Now I'd rather sort of go with it being clean. Very sad, very sad. They've got stress-busting ears, these dogs, haven't they? You can fiddle with these things all day. There are two minutes to be off.